Well, it doesn't count if cli- as climate change if it's better for humanity. Oh, okay, it's only no. it's only things that are bad for humanity that are called climate change. Okay, you got to get your terms right. Here. I apologize. Dr. Roy Spencer, thank you for being with us, sir. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, we're very happy to have you. So for people who don't know, uh, we're going to get into some climate science here. We've had Patrick Moore on. Um, uh, Dr. Spencer is a principal research scientist at University of Alabama Huntsville and senior scientist for climate studies at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's yeah. I used to be at NASA and then I switched to UAH. Okay, good. Well, I just want to get this right because let, let's hit this off the bat. This could very likely go, you know, on YouTube. People can post their comments and subscribe. By the way. Um, they're going to discredit you. Uh, we've heard everything from big oil to he's a Christian, therefore his uh, opinions are invalid, depending on our guests. What do you think? Let's get this out of the way. What would they say before we get into your scientific research as to why you aren't allowed to hold an opinion? Oh, wow. That's the first time I've been asked to criticize myself. But that's okay. <laughs> I, no, I, not I, criticize I, yourself. What do you think they'll say about oh, you? Oh, well. Okay, first of all, they assume that I'm funded by big oil, mm-hmm. which my typical response is uh, I wish. Yeah. And if someone listening would like to donate from big oil, my uh, my bank account number is... Well, hold on, yeah. <laughs> we don't have LifeLock. They're not a sponsor yet. But yeah, uh, okay. there you go. Uh, so yeah, I wish that was the case. But you know, big oil doesn't have to you know, doesn't have to pay people to support their case. I mean, right. people are lining up lining up in Dallas, Texas, trying to get gas. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. It is. Uh, it is. So you, if you did have big oil money, we'll be clear because people will do some digging. You would be upfront about it, gaudy, like a Flava Flav chain. Yes. You'd just be like, Spencer, big yes. oil, and we would know about it. You'd have a reality show. Okay, we've got that out of the way. Um, you talk a lot about how uh, some people who, someone who, does, you're someone who doesn't follow lockstep, obviously, with the kind of climate sort of group think right now. I'm not a scientist. I'm very clear about that. Most people watching aren't scientists. So where do you think is the key issue where most people, as they try to disseminate this info coming in from the news, where do you think it is that they miss it, particularly as it relates to people like Al Gore uh, deceiving or deceptively sort of presenting data? Where's the key place that you think simpletons like me miss it? Well, I think the most powerful technique that Al Gore uses in his movies, his first movie and then his his second movie that came out most recently, is he shows very dramatic video of things that happen in nature, okay, whether it's hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding of the streets in Miami Beach, uh, let's see, melting ice uh, in Greenland. The thing is, all of these things happen naturally, right. okay? These right. all happen naturally, and very often he doesn't say, this is global warming. He leaves it for you to infer that this is being caused by global warming. Uh, so basically, everything he shows in his movies are things that happen naturally. Uh, he states things. Sometimes he'll say, well, these are getting worse, and almost never is it a case that the scientists... <laughs> <laughs> Well, okay, that was going to be my question, because scientists would say, well, these things happen naturally, but if it happens at a dramatically accelerated rate, like right now would be a good time. People are saying that hurricane season, you know, this is unprecedented right now, what we're looking at, uh, obviously, uh, with, uh, with Florida and the Caribbean. Is, is that a, a case? Uh, I would say no, it's not unprecedented. Uh, you might remember that when Harvey came along, we had reached almost 12 years since there had been a Category 3, that is a major hurricane strike in the United States. There's a scientist at NASA that calculated that the chances of that happening is like once every 300 years to go 12 years without a major hurricane strike in the United States. So wouldn't that be climate change? Because it's, Mm -hmm. wouldn't that be climate change? Because it's an anomaly? We went a long time (laughs) without a disaster? Well, it doesn't count as climate change if it's better for humanity. Okay, it's only only things that are bad for humanity that are called climate change. Okay, you got to get your terms right. I apologize. Uh, Okay. Um, (laughs) And then let's look at the storms that we have seen. Okay, so Harvey was a Category 4 that went into Texas. All right? Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the intensity. I went back through all the hurricanes that have occurred since 1870 that have struck Texas. There were 21 or 22 of them. Half of them occurred when the Gulf of Mexico was cooler than normal. Half of them occurred when the Gulf of Mexico was warmer than normal. In other words, the Gulf of Mexico 
in the summertime is always warm enough to support a major hurricane. And I come from a background where I researched hurricanes. That's what I did for my PhD uh, dissertation. Mm -hmm. And for a hurricane to occur, it's kind of like tornadoes. For a hurricane or a tornado to occur, you have to have all kinds of different things that come together in the right, you know, the right ingredients. And water temperature, you know, from say global warming is only one of them. And so far there's no good evidence that increasing sea surface temperatures increase the intensity of hurricanes. Now, Irma, we've got a second one out there. They're saying it may be a record setter. Well, I, I don't know about that, whether that's, it depends on how you measure hurricanes. Sure. Uh, the 1935 Labor Day hurricane that uh, made landfall in the Keys holds the record for the lowest barometric pressure ever in a hurricane landfalling in the United States. It's the lowest pressure ever, ever recorded in the United States. Had 185 mile an hour estimated wind when it hit um, when it hit the upper keys. Now, it sounds like um, Irma might be five miles an hour, might have hit five miles per hour faster than that. Well, the uncertainty in these storms of measuring, you know, highest sustained winds to within five or 10 miles an hour, they, you know, it's just sort of a guesstimate. It's, right. I mean, it's, it's an educated guesstimate. Well, for, for, they do have for people like me who aren't scientists, right? So they'll throw out, and I was reading this today, where they say, well, we, this year we've had record uh, wet, record dry, and record heat, that these are the hottest years on record. And they've said that there's clearly a continuing trend. If you look at these graphs, that it's been getting hotter and hotter and hotter um, it, with a, a direct correlation to, to CO2. That's what's circulating today. Record wets, record dries. Is, is that accurate? And, and is that, again, could they make the case in a, in a very solid way? Well, it, I would say in general, no, it's not accurate. Okay. Because in order to determine whether global warming is causing these things, you have to have global statistics. So anytime they've done studies of whether weather is getting worse, whether floods are getting worse, whether droughts are getting worse, droughts are getting worse, uh, there's no long-term change meteorologically. Now, you have something like Harvey come along. Mm -hmm. Now, it did... I mean, it's still up for debate, but it, it might be a record setter for the total amount of rainfall that fell over, say, 20,000 square miles. OK, right. uh, it was a lot of rain. Well, the reason why it was a lot of rain is it was a very rare circumstance where the hurricane came on shore and then stalled for days. I mean, that almost never happened. That's what I was going and, to say. Is that even possible to predict that kind of a pattern that would stall, sit, camp out there in rain? It seems as though that caught a lot of people by surprise. Uh, well, days before that thing hit, I was looking at the forecast models and I was warning people, this is going to be a catastrophic rain producer. I mean, it's not just me. It was, you know, people knew that this was going to be a big rain producer because it did look like the steering current currents in the atmosphere we're going to weaken temporarily enough to where that thing was going to sit there and rain for a few days. Right. So the forecast, I think, was that there was going to be a huge amount of rainfall, uh, which is what happened. OK, so I don't, I don't want to just focus on that. I do want to get back to kind of this this idea, because this is what most people believe. Um, why is it then when we, we read so many articles that attribute hurricane season to or a more severe season to climate change when we read today wettest uh, records, driest records? Because I've gone from global warming to extremes, right? Extreme cold, extreme heat, extreme weather patterns. People will say this. Well, why believe you when there are so many scientists on the other side of the spectrum? You know, how is it that all of them have gotten it wrong? That's the, the question we most commonly hear from any, to debunk the idea of even being skeptical of climate policy. What makes you correct and them incorrect? Well, you have to be careful about what is it that I and other scientists disagree on. And right. you'd probably be surprised that the vast majority of climate researchers that I know would agree with me on a lot of issues. Okay. You and the media and the public hear from a relatively small minority of very vocal scientists who have decided to hitch their wagon to this whole global warming Armageddon thing. But why? Why but, would they hitch their wagon to that? Well, for one thing, their salaries, their careers, including my career, depends on a never-ending stream of funding coming out 
of the United States Congress. Okay. Because that's junk episodes don't make themselves. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Bill Nye needs to get those Emmys. Yes. Continue. (laughs) <laughs> that's that's where all the money comes from to support this. Okay. And if there, I mean, I used to work for the government. I used to help put together packages to present to Congress to get money out of Congress to fund NASA programs. Okay. Okay. And if there isn't a problem to study, you don't get the money. Right. Okay? Ex- exactly. So where where would be the common ground that you would agree with a lot of other climate scientists that might surprise people? Uh, excellent question. Where we would agree is that the CO2 that we're producing from burning fossil fuels and that we're putting into the atmosphere is causing some warming. Okay. Right? I agree with that. Uh, it may be at least half the warming, which it turns – have you heard the, the 97% meme – 97% of all scientists believe blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah, we debunked that. I know that comes from a very, very limited uh, limited survey sent out where if you didn't answer right. yes to the first couple of questions, they didn't include you, but yeah. Well, when I looked at those questions, I thought, gee, I'm part of the 97% because <laughs> I, could go, I could go along with, you know, about half the warming or more could be due to increasing CO2. In fact, you know, we published research that suggests that maybe it's about half. Mm-hmm. But think about it. If half of only half of the warming is our fault and it's only warming at half the rate that the climate models are predicting, that that means the human influence is only about a quarter of what they are claiming is going to happen or should have happened by now due to humans. And all of that claim is the basis for changes in energy policy. Right. So. So I think, yes, I think humans do contribute to warming. Uh, and, you know, then you have to get into, OK, so what can we do about it? Paris, the Paris Treaty isn't going to do anything about it. That's a whole other issue. Right. It switched from Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Accord. And I was there in Cancun at the climate summit where Ted, uh, uh, not Ted Kennedy, um, Ted Turner proposed China's one child policy. And it is important to note, we kind of gloss over this because we have the time with a brilliant scientist. And I obviously discuss policy more so. Uh, these policies will kill people. They will kill people in third world countries. They will rob them of their industrial revolutions. They can be absolutely catastrophic for humanity, not Gaia. Um, let me get into uh, something here that I find interesting. So I've been reading up on some of your research, and you actually, something that uh, a lot of viewers may not be familiar with, you've done some research on how clouds, or lack thereof, actually, in tropical regions, release heat out into space as opposed to uh, sort of trapping heat into the Earth's atmosphere. This is something that I would imagine nobody watching this has really heard about. Um, can you boil that down for people who might not be scientists watching this so it's something they could look into? Okay, let me preface what I'm going to say with a a little lesson about all of this. The the CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere uh, produces a small amount of what we call direct warming. Mm -hmm. uh, And it would be so little that no one would really care about it, okay? Uh, And I agree with the consensus of scientists that increasing CO2 does cause that little bit of direct warming. Okay. Where we disagree is how will the climate system respond? And this is where your question about clouds comes in. One of the biggest mysteries uh, about whether global warming is going to be you know, benign, don't worry about it, or it's Al Gore's Armageddon, is <laughs> will, clouds, will clouds increase with warming, which would be offset the warming and make warming even less, or will clouds decrease with warming? which would amplify the warming and make things even worse. The consensus of opinion is that clouds are gonna decrease with warming and that that makes things even worse. That makes the warming stronger and stronger. Right. I think think just the opposite happens and we published papers to support that. Um, I even wrote a book, a popular book on it called The Great Global Warming Blunder about clouds and whoa, whoa, whoa. don't try and sneak one plug per per episode pal we're <laughs> plugging the inconvenient deception there you might be the scientist but i've hosted a few years continue okay okay i i, I withdraw <laughs> i withdraw the book yes all right but i'm fascinated by this please do continue okay but what's fascinating about this cloud issue is i had always heard because before i worked in this i had heard i i had asked the question how do scientists know that when it warms, that clouds will decrease? And those and they 
And the answer I would get from scientists would be, well, we see that when it's warmer outside, there's fewer clouds. And I said, but couldn't that be because the clouds decrease and let more sunshine in? In other words, they were thinking of causation in only one direction. Right. That warming causes fewer clouds. I asked the question, couldn't fewer clouds cause warming? It turns out that when you include both directions of causation, which is what really goes on in nature, that uh, <clears throat> the, that nature can look like this positive feedback they are fearing, mm -hmm. when in fact negative cloud feedback is actually occurring. You can get, in other words, you can get totally the wrong answer about whether warming causes a decrease in clouds if you don't account for causation in the opposite direction. We quantified this with a simple climate model. We compared it to satellite data, um, and we published a few papers on it. How have they responded since this has been sort of popular consensus to use the term? I know a lot of scientists hate the term consensus. How have they responded to your published research um, questioning the baseline theory? For the most part, they've responded with silence. Ah, there's ah. there's one or two people that published papers trying to counter what I did, and I think they were basically, you know, bringing up red herrings, attacking straw men. Uh, I, I just can't believe that the papers got published because mm -hmm. they certainly didn't refute. I still stand by everything we published. It's a problem which <clears throat> I think is being swept under the rug. I think for the most part, they don't even understand what I'm talking about. And maybe someday after I die, somebody on the other side will rediscover this issue <laughs> yeah. and claim it for their own. I don't care, you know, it, I just care that eventually they will understand it and include it in their climate models because all of this affects how the climate models behave. And right now the climate models are producing twice as much warming as they should be, okay, right. compared to observations. Why don't they fix the climate models? You know, I mean, that's partly a political it would I, seem I, if their goal is to, to save people from catastrophic climate change, they would want to correct the models to be as accurate as possible. It seems like everyone should be on board with that. Let's get it as close to possible so we can predict weather patterns, so we can save people from storms. Um, that's what does, just as, as, as a simpleton, again, a non-scientist, I look at it and it seems like it is, it is such this giant barge if you try to shift the direction mm. at all based on new data. What were we going to say, Jared, then we have to go uh, to I just theorizing. I think Al Gore's a little busy to respond because he's too busy filming that Armageddon 2 with Ben Affleck. Yes, he is. He's filming with Ben Affleck, and, uh, and I think Bruce Willis is in that one. All right, final <laughs> question, because you say hopefully people will understand. Let me ask you this, to try and laser in, what is it that you would want the average citizen, a non-scientist, if you could get them just desperately to understand one thing, people who are waking up and worry about climate change um, and the science, what do they need to know that they're missing? As far as the science go, I would say you don't have to choose between one side which says global warming is a disaster, we're gonna to have to do something about it or we're all gonna die. And you don't have to choose the other end of the spectrum which is, oh, it's all a giant hoax, you know, global warming is all, you know, just made up, it's a conspiracy, blah, 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 blah. That I'm sort of in the middle and I hate to say that because I didn't, you know, to me, that sounds boring being middle of the road. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, you know, that's why I'm called a lukewarmer. I think it, the issue is overblown. Yes, adding CO2 to the atmosphere causes some warming, but it's not enough for us to be concerned about. Plus, what we haven't discussed is we can't do anything about it anyway, policy wise, because you can't generate enough solar and wind to meet a substantial portion of humanity's energies, energy needs. Right. And more importantly, and even if we did, we can't force China to. Yeah, we'll get right on that. Nothing but solar power. They bought it. <laughs> and then you just start using more coal and throwing kids into the factories and putting a sickle in their hand once they uh, do their birth make assessment. Make some great Nikes, though. Make some, they do. They make some fantastic sneakers. All right. That is Dr. Roy Spencer. You can follow him on Twitter with your questions. I'm sure you have no doubt. Or leave your uh, questions below at, at Roy W. Spencer. The book is An Inconvenient Deception, How Al Gore Distorts Climate Science and Energy Policy. I highly recommend it. I love books that give you a baseline. This is what someone is saying. This is the claim. These are the facts. It's really referenceable. Uh, Dr. Spencer, thank you so much. We'll have to have you back. Maybe, maybe you and Patrick Moore, we can have a Royal Rumble.
<laughs> if you like this video, subscribe by clicking the subscribe button. It's, at, it's in a, a circle now. It used to be a square, which most buttons aren't squares. Unless it's on a phone. There are square buttons on phones, but most buttons are circles. You understand what I'm talking about. Or watch the recommended video, which is popping up in a box. Or subscribe at ladderwithcrider.com slash mug club. Join the mug club so you can get the daily show. And that means that you are not beholden to the YouTube censoring overlords. But let's be honest. You like being there where you are, under their thumb. Power bottom you.